Hello, everyone. I was invited to speak about the importance of biotechnology for sustaining life on Earth. And so I'm very delighted to be telling you about our new model that employs a DSI approach for using biotechnology for biodiversity conservation. We're actually just a couple weeks out or so from launching our platform, which is exciting. Um, and as you'll see when I describe it, we sort of have training wheels on in terms of DSI architecture. Um, but that actually feels like the right way to be proceeding because of how novel our model is. And so I'm happy, happy to be able to talk to you about this today and maybe get some feedback or even interest in collaboration. Um, but before we get to the platform, I'd like us to first look briefly at why there's a need to do biodiversity conservation differently. Why business as usual isn't going to be enough. And I'm going to give you that perspective through a series of images of a very real problem that DSI architecture could address. So let's start by remembering a time when biotechnology was not needed, when ecosystems were in balance, and the first human civilizations lived in harmony with nature, taking only what they needed and making sure they left their environments intact and flourishing. This all started to change, as I'm sure you know, when explorers and settlers from wealthy nations began to discover and colonize these exotic, abundant places. They saw opportunities. They took land, extinguished cultures, enslaved, and in many cases, exterminated native peoples, all in the interest of gaining more land, more power, and more wealth. They saw the environment and many of its life forms as things they could control, utilize, extract from. And because of these values and behaviors, the wealth that the Earth held in natural resources has been gradually converted into wealth in people's pockets. The effects of this behavior on both indigenous peoples and the planet have been horrific. It's impossible to overstate the injustices done to indigenous peoples which carry over to this day, and the damage being done to our planet, in which huge swaths of land and waters have lost the biological balance that sustained them. And we have now allowed this behavior to go on for so long that we are in an urgent situation. We're now in the midst of a sixth mass extinction with an unprecedented loss in biodiversity. It's estimated that Thousands of species are going extinct every year, which is roughly 1,000 times the natural extinction rate, and that 1 million species will become extinct in the coming decades. And this is the only mass extinction which can be attributed to human activity, with the primary causes being land and sea use change leading to loss of habitats, exploitation of wildlife, pollution, climate change, and invasive species. So to provide a sense of what this means, let's define biodiversity. Biodiversity is the variety of all living things and in their interactions. And it's typically measured at three levels, genetic diversity, species diversity, and ecosystem diversity. And so why should we care about losing biodiversity? In short, our lives, our health, our well-being, well -being, and our livelihoods are all dependent on the lives of other species and their ecosystems such that a loss of these species, a loss of biodiversity, affects a broad range of human needs, including our food, clean water, a safe environment, resilience to infectious disease and natural disasters, and a stable economy. OK, so to make this more concrete, let's consider the work of a group of scientists who developed what is called the Planetary Boundaries Framework. What they did was to look at Earth as a system of biophysical and biochemical processes that regulate the planet. And they identified the boundaries of these processes that, if exceeded, could lead to catastrophic and irreversible environmental change, destabilizing the Earth's ability to support human life. One of these boundaries is biosphere integrity. And one of the key measurements of biosphere integrity is genomic diversity. And what they found is that the estimated loss of genetic diversity since pre-industrial times has already greatly exceeded the amount of loss considered acceptable for maintaining a safe operating space for humanity. So this is a very clear validation of the importance of genetic diversity on the health of the planet. 
which actually has been known for a long time by scientists practicing conservation genomics. In conservation genomics, the genomes of species, their DNA footprint, blueprint, is sequenced. And the analysis of those sequences allows all kinds of informed decisions on conservation strategies. For example, this is the alala, the Hawaiian crow, which is endemic to Hawaii, found nowhere else on Earth. And tragically, it is extinct in the wild due to loss of habitat, disease, and predation by invasive species. The remaining 70 or so alala that still exist are being protected in conservation facilities on Maui and the Big Island, where they are part of a captive breeding program. In fact, the Maui facility was almost lost during the fires of last fall, but luckily it was not. Um, anyway, by sequencing these birds' DNA, scientists learned that the remaining birds are all very closely related. Basically, they are all family members. So that tells us that the genetic diversity of this species has been severely reduced or bottlenecked. But also, by knowing each bird's genetic sequence, um, that means for the captive breeding program, scientists can choose which birds are more suitable as mating pairs and they will pair the birds that are the least related to each other um, to minimize inbreeding because those offspring will have the best chance of survival. Okay, so, so the biotechnology of genomic sequencing is one of the most important uh, technologies for conservation um, approaches. Um, and then another really important approach in conservation genomics is cryopreservation or biobanking which is the freezing down of living cells or tissues from a species in order to preserve not only their genetic material, the DNA, but also the potential of adding that genetic material back into the gene pool, uh, a, te a technique called genetic rescue. And there's a really nice example of this in um, the conservation world. It's the conservation of a wild horse called the Zhivalski's horse. At one point, this horse was extinct in the wild, like the Alala, and the populations being maintained in zoos came from only 12 founder horses. So again, there was this genetic bottleneck. Fortunately, the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, Alliance Frozen Zoo, had biobanked a living cell line from a Zhivalski's horse 40 years earlier. And together with a biotech company, they were able to clone a male Zhivalski's horse from that frozen material. They've actually done this twice now. And those clone males are being brought up with other Zhivalski's horses at the zoo, and they'll eventually breed with other Zhivalski's horses, which will introduce the, their new di genetic diversity back into the gene pool. So that is two examples of using biotechnologies, applying it to conservation of species. And there are actually lots of other ways genomics is being utilized. Um, and there are a number of conservation organizations, zoos, academic labs, doing this kind of work all over the world. The largest of these is the Earth Biogenome Project, um, which is a consortium of 58 projects having the goal of sequencing all of Earth's eukaryotic biodiversity in 10 years. Um, and we were recently approved to be one of the affiliates. It's a fantastic project. It's being called a moonshot for biology, and it is really needed because less than 1% of known species have been sequenced to date. So there's plenty of work to go around. However, our view at Wise Ancestors is that while these efforts to sequence and biobank are critical, they are moving too slowly, and they are not enough. For conservation to be effective for the long term, we also need to address the root causes of, the, of this crisis, which, as I mentioned before, are based on human values and behaviors. So how do we do that? How do we address the root causes of the biodiversity crisis? So it happens that there is a telling statistic. 80% of Earth's remaining biodiversity is on land that is inhabited by indigenous peoples and local communities. And this is not a coincidence. These communities have been successfully stewarding land for millennia, relying on knowledge and practices that are still highly relevant for our planet today. Our belief is that saving Earth's genetic diversity, species and ecosystems, and by extension humanity, will require looking towards an indigenous value system and a revitalization of indigenous science, knowledge, and practices. However, extreme care must be taken in implementing such an approach to ensure that we don't repeat colonial extractive behaviors that deny indigenous peoples the rights to control their own data and resources. So with that in mind, 
Our mission is to advance decentralized genomic research that is co-developed with indigenous peoples and local communities for biodiversity conservation. So how do we do this? What do we actually do? Um, the first phase of our model shown, shown on the screen is community engagement. And as we go through the model, I'll describe what a typical project might look like. So each project starts with this community engagement phase in which we reach out and build relationships with indigenous people, local communities, local scientists, environmental agencies, etc., to define a conservation challenge. The project co-development stage includes identifying the species of interest, defining the technical work needed, obtaining consent from the community regarding the sampling and the project itself, developing mutually agreed terms, and defining what we're calling the upfront benefit sharing component. So the upfront benefit sharing is an investment we make in a local community project, such as land stewardship, species conservation work, or conservation-related capacity building. And it's intended to bring indigenous people and local communities and their practices into ecosystem management. So a typical conservation challenge might be to obtain a permit, collect the samples, and create a reference genome, which is a complete genome that serves as a reference for future studies for a specific endangered bird and to biobank living tissue um, for future work. So when a specific community is connected to the species, the mutually agreed terms might include a requirement for the information provided about the project or the metadata um, that it includes a description of the community's connection to the species and any rules they want to impose around commercial use of the samples of the data. Um, the benefit sharing component might also, might be to support an initiative for an indigenous community members to restore a piece of land with native crop plants that are also a food source for the endangered bird. So after the community engagement project co-development stage is complete, we post the conservation challenge on our platform along with the amount of funding needed to carry it out. And we run a fundraising campaign to fund the project. Once the funds have reached the target amount, we then fund the benefit sharing project and we open the challenge for potential collaborators to, to apply to perform the various phases of the work. Sampling, sequencing, biobanking, bioinformatic analysis, all of the phases of these projects. And once we've assembled the scientific team to perform the work, we give them the green light to get started. And as the work is completed for each phase of the challenge, the collaborator will upload the results of their work so that we can review it and either approve or communicate back to the collaborator if we have questions. And so as the work for each phase is completed satisfactorily, we will release the funds to pay that particular collaborator. Okay. And as the work is completed, the reference genome assembly is complete, uploaded to a database, um, the sampling has um, been biobanked, then we generate a final challenge report with all of the challenge details, the required metadata from the community, and any initial findings, and we share that back to the local community. We post it on our website, and we also document it on blockchain. So now I just have a few screenshots of our platform. As I said, it's not live yet. Um, this is the dashboard with five challenges posted. Um, if I'm just the general public, I can get to this, to this level of the platform, and I could click info and read more info about each of these individual challenges. If I happen to believe in one of the challenges and want to support it, I can click fund challenge and then I can provide some money through Stripe to help fund the challenge. If I'm a scientist and I read about the challenge and I, and I, can, I believe I have something to contribute, I want to work on this challenge, then I click on collaborate and that leads the scientist through a process of um, applying to be a collaborator with us. Um, so this is next, this screen is just what the, you, you can't see it, it's too white, but this is the detailed page. Um, and then if I'm a collaborator and I'm looking at all the different phases, um, not a great shot, but you can click on it. Let's say if I wanted to do the sampling for RNA-seq, I can click plus and see what are the details of the scientific work that need to happen and can my lab provide that work if I can through our PAP platform. I apply to be a collaborator. 
That application goes to the Wise Ancestors administrators. They review it. This is how the Wise Ancestors administrators assemble the team, by getting people to apply to the platform here. Putting it all together, the model I've described supports our four primary goals. First one, create an efficient, scalable model for performing decentralized conservation science. Our online platform allows an unlimited number of conservation challenges to be running simultaneously. Unlimited collaborators can submit applications to work with us, and unlimited members of the general public can support our challenges. It also streamlines project coordination and management, so it's really a nice model for efficient team science. And this contrast, if you've heard from the earlier talks, with typical scientific projects, where the source of funding largely dictates what work is done, the timing of the work, and by whom. So to our knowledge, scientific projects are not carried out in this decentralized way anywhere else in the world right now. Um, second, employ the most advanced biotechnology approaches by inviting applications for collaboration from the entire scientific community. We will constantly have opportunities to engage with labs and companies as they develop their latest technologies. This way, we can benefit from improvements in sampling, sample prep, sequencing, analysis, cryopreservation, all of the different steps. Um, enable future scientific approaches. The biobank samples will enable technologies developed in the future to be applied to species that exist today. Such new technologies could enable, for example, sequencing that is faster and less expensive than today's costs, sequencing of intractable genomes, and cloning of species that's not technically possible today. And then finally, implement sustainable behaviors and practices by engaging with and uplifting indigenous people in local communities and incorporating indigenous science, knowledge, and practices in conservation activities. We are addressing the root cause of biodiversity loss by replacing unsustainable behaviors and practices with sustainable behaviors and practices. Um, just as an aside, I want to point out that this photo of this bird, um, that bird does not have a name because it was just recently discovered in Colombia. We're working with the scientists who discovered this bird to sequence it. But sadly, as soon as this bird does have a scientific name, it's going to be on the critically endangered list because the scientists already know there's only about 100 or so and their, their habitat is just um, being you know, demolished by cattle farming. Um, so it's just a reminder that species are going extinct before we even know they exist, which is pretty sad. So what's next? With our prototype decentralized system on training wheels, is the way I think about it, we're creating workflows and usage experience that we imagine could potentially be used to help develop an AI-powered, truly decentralized system that will allow much faster and smarter execution of these conservation challenges and a massive scaling up. That will leave us humans free to focus on more deeply engaging with indigenous people and local communities so that we can fully explore how humanity might live in harmony with nature. And then I'd like to point out our team. This is a photo of us at a workshop in Hawaii. Um, the gentleman in the middle is Prime. He is a um, local Hawaiian um, graffiti artist um, surrounded by some wise ancestors. And then I'd just like to call out some of our team. Um, David Hausler um, leads the UCSC Genomics Institute. He's been a key player in assembling the first working draft of the human genome and making it public for the Human Genome Project. And he's basically shaping the field of genomics and open data policy. Keolu Fox, he's a, the first Native Hawaiian to receive a doctorate in geno genome sciences. He's a professor at UC San Diego. And he's so much more than that. If you want to talk about indigenous futurism or biocomputing, he's the guy. And he'll be speaking tomorrow at 10 o'clock, I believe. Um, Beth Shapiro is CSO at Colossal Biosciences, and she literally wrote the books on how to clone a mammoth and life as we made it. Um, Anthony Aguirre is a cosmologist who founded Future of Life Institute, Future of Life Foundation, other organizations, and he's an existential crisis guru. And then among our staff, we're in amazing hands with Alex Smilek as our strategic and creative director. Um, for our advisors, 
Ollie Ryder is Director of Conservation Genetics at San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance, and he's actually the namesake of the second Zhivalski's horse to be cloned, little foal Ollie. And then um, Federica Di Palma is a leader in bridging genomic science efforts around the globe. And then Anne McCartney and Rachel Meyer are genome scientists who are really fierce advocates of indigenous rights and interests. I want to shout out to our initial funders, the Future of Life Institute, and invite you to follow us on social media. Feel free to email me um, and join us in being wise ancestors. Thank you.